Welcome to the lecture on compounding emulsions. It needs to be clear early on why you would want to make an emulsion and how an emulsion is very different from a solution or even a suspension. So, the first idea to convey is that when combining two liquids, knowing whether they are miscible or immiscible. When two liquids are considered to be completely soluble in each other, that is they are molecularly dispersed in each other in all proportions, then those liquids are said to be miscible. Example of miscible liquids include water mixed with alcohol or olive oil mixed with cottonseed oil. On the other hand, other liquid pairs such as castor oil and alcohol are said to be partially miscible, which means that they are soluble in each other but only in a definite proportion. On the other hand, immiscible liquid pairs are liquids that are imperceptibly soluble in each other in any proportion. This means that they just do not mix with each other. Examples would include water and mineral oil, and alcohol and mineral oil. Those liquid pairs do not mix together. A problem occurs when we want need to compound a product and disperse one of those liquids within the other. So how can we do that if the two liquids are immiscible? The answer is to formulate an emulsion. Emulsions are defined as two phase systems in which one liquid is dispersed, not solubilized, but dispersed throughout another liquid in the form of small droplets. In order to form those small droplets, we must first perform emulsification. Emulsification is the process of creating an emulsion from two immiscible liquid phases through the addition of emulsifying agents. Now, emulsifying agents are surfactants that concentrate at the interface of the two immiscible liquids and reduce the interfacial tension between these phases and provide a barrier around the droplets as they form. This barrier prevents coalescence of the drops. The emulsifying agent causes one of the liquids to form small droplets, which are collectively called the internal phase, and which become dispersed in the other liquid phase, which is called the external phase. The two liquids never solubilize, that is, they do not join together, but the droplet size of the internal phase can be so fine and well dispersed as to be indistinguishable. However, over time, several changes can occur within the internal phase. The first change that occur and occur is creaming. Creaming is defined as the migration of droplets of the internal phase to the top or the bottom of the emulsion. Creaming is a normal change that occurs with emulsions as they stand for a period of time. Smaller droplets tend to cling together and will, depending on their density, either migrate to the top or the bottom. If the internal phase is less dense than the external phase, it will rise to the top of the emulsion. If it is denser than the external phase, it will sink to the bottom. While creaming is normal, it is why emulsions need to be shaken vigorously each time before their use. A bigger problem, or bigger than creaming, is coalescence. Coalescence is the merging of small drops into larger droplets with the eventual complete separation of the phases. With significant coalescence, the droplets become too large and cannot be re-emulsified by simply shaking the product. In coalescence, the barrier formed by the emulsifying agent is broken or destroyed, which is irreversible. Coalescence of droplets is frequently called cracking of an emulsion. Therefore, the formulation of an emulsion should prevent coalescence from occurring while reducing the rate at which the natural tendency towards creaming occurs. Therapeutically, emulsions are used in two main areas. The first is as an oral delivery vehicle, although this is the least common reason to compound or use an emulsion. An oral emulsion can be formulated and is used when it is necessary to make a liquid product out of an oil when the solubility or the bioavailability characteristics of the drug make this delivery system clearly superior. Usually this occurs when you have some drug that is much more stable or soluble in oil and which also has to be given orally. The reason this is a problem is because oils have an objectionable taste and feel in the mouth and therefore have poor patient acceptance. So a pharmacist can formulate an oral emulsion to basically make the drug containing oil more palatable. This is done by dispersing the oil as the internal phase of an emulsion while making the external phase out of a pleasant tasting flavored vehicle. 
The more common reason to formulate an emulsion is to create a topical product. While oils are not generally tolerated orally, they have several beneficial effects when used on the skin. Topical, oil-containing emulsions are emollient and soothing, as well as being protective to sensitive skin, all of which are often desirable of topical preparations. When oils are emulsified versus using a pure oil, they tend to feel less greasy and are more aesthetically appealing to patients. In summary, pharmacists may compound an emulsion for either oral or topical use. However, the latter is more commonly seen in practice. When compounding an emulsion, we are trying to mix an oil-containing liquid with a water-containing liquid. Using emulsifiers, we can disperse one liquid phase, the internal phase, as droplets within the other liquid phase, which is called the external phase. By manipulating the three factors described below, we can create either an oil-in-water emulsion, where oil is the internal phase, or the opposite, a water-in-oil emulsion, where water is the internal phase. Between these two types, oil and water emulsions are the most common type compounded because they are preferable for oral products due to their improved taste, as well as for topical products because of their non-greasy feel and also being water washable. There are three different factors that can be manipulated to determine which emulsion type, oil and water, or water and oil, will be created. The first factor is the actual emulsifier used. Some emulsifiers can form either type of emulsion, whereas others will only form one type. Thus, it is imperative to correctly select an appropriate emulsifying agent based on the type of an emulsion you want to compound. The second factor is called the phase ratio, which refers to the relative volumes of oil and water mixed. When considered by itself, meaning with all other things being equal, the phase present in the greater amount tends to be the external phase, and the smaller volume ingredient becomes the internal phase. Note that certain emulsifiers can overcome an unfavorable phase ratio if desired, but generally speaking, the larger the volume becomes the external phase and the smaller volume the internal phase. The third factor which can influence the type of emulsion formed is the order of mixing. Because the phase that is present in the greater volume tends to be the external phase, the phase that is being added, usually by portion, tends to be the internal phase. Begin with the entire volume of the external phase, and then in increments add the internal phase, stopping to thoroughly mix between additions. The external phase will continue to accommodate the ad added internal phase as small droplets form. However, once again, the use of emulsifiers can overcome this factor. For example, if using an emulsifier, it is often best to disperse it completely in the internal phase. This creates a high concentration of emulsifier within the phase to be internalized. Then the external phase is added and quickly mixed to form the emulsion. So while phase ratio and the order of mixing can influence the type of emulsion formed, the greatest influence is often produced by the types and amounts of emulsifiers used to the, or added to the formulation. When compounding an emulsion, there are three main compounding goals for our final product. The first goal is that the internal phase should be dispersed in the form of very small, fine droplets. This goal is influenced by the mechanical method used for mixing and shearing of the two immiscible liquids. For extemporaneous compounding, a rough-sided wedgewood mortar has traditionally been used for the emulsification process. Alternatively, simple and relatively inexpensive hand homogenizers and high-speed blenders are now available, and which may give an even finer and more uniform droplet. The more efficient and the mechanical method of mixing and shearing of the liquids, the finer the droplet size will be. The second compounding goal is to slow aggregation of these droplets. All emulsions eventually cream at some rate, and remember, creaming is when droplets tend to either rise to the top or go to the bottom. Nevertheless, the rate of creaming should be slow enough to ensure accurate measurement of a dose or an application of a uniform product. Factors which influence aggregation rate include droplet size, the viscosity of the external phase, and the relative density difference of the internal and external phases. Aggregation and creaming can be slowed through proper emulsification and the use of various additives such as viscosity-inducing agents. The third compounding goal is to have a product that can be easily redispersed. 
While aggregation and creaming are unavoidable, the product should be formulated so that the internal phase readily and easily redisperses to give a nice uniform emulsion when the product is shaken. To summarize, the three goals are to have small and fine internal phase droplets, to slow aggregation or creaming of those droplets, and to ensure that the product can be easily redispersed when shaken. To achieve these three compounding goals, emulsification and the appropriate use of emulsifying agents are the key. The appropriate choice and use of emulsifying agents is critical for being able to obtain the three compounding goals for emulsions. There are three main categories or types of emulsifiers commonly used to compound emulsions. The first type of emulsifier to discuss are the water-soluble polymers. Acacia is the primary example, but there are others including xanth gum and other cellulose derivatives. Nevertheless, acacia really is the traditional agent used because it is unique among these polymers in its ability to form an emulsion using only a wedge wood mortar and pestle. As such, it is a useful ingredient for the extemporaneous compounding of emulsions and is usually one of the first emulsifying agents considered. Acacia emulsions tend to favor oil and water emulsions. When using a fixed oil, such as vegetable oil or mineral oil, the oil to water to acacia ratio to use is 4 to 2 to 1. So use one part acacia for every two parts of water and four parts of oil. Fixed oils form acacia emulsions more readily than do mineral oils, so if there is a choice of oils to use when using acacia as the emulsifier, it would be better to choose a vegetable oil. The advantage to using acacia is that you can use the mortar method to prepare it. Begin by calculating ingredient amounts based on the appropriate ratio already discussed. Because acacia forms water and oil emulsions, oil would be the internal phase. Therefore, all of the oil in the formulation must be emulsified when making the primary emulsion. After the primary emulsion is formed, then the emulsion may be diluted with any extra water or water miscible liquid such as flavoring vehicles. Additionally, water-soluble drugs may also be added after the primary emulsion has been formed. This procedure is illustrated on the next slide. This slide shows the dry gum method of creating an acacia primary emulsion. The dry gum method is the preferred method when using acacia as it generally takes less time and effort than the wet gum method. The picture on the top left shows that we have added all of the calculated amount of acacia and the entire volume of oil to the Wedgwood mortar and began by carefully wetting the acacia powder with the oil and continued to add the entire volume of oil and thoroughly mix them together until a slurry has formed with the acacia being homogeneously dispersed throughout the oil. The amount of water calculated from the ratio already given is measured in a clean, dry, graduated cylinder. As shown on the top right picture, the entire volume of water is then added all at once. Then, as shown in the bottom left picture, the water is mixed with hard and fast trituration. This step is the key to the dry gum method. Trituration is continued until the primary emulsion is formed. You know the emulsion is formed when the product changes from a translucent, oily appearing liquid into a thick, white liquid as shown on the bottom right picture. The sound of trituration also changes to give a crackling sound. Once the primary emulsion is formed, then other ingredients may be added. The second type of emulsifiers used are not added, but rather created from a chemical reaction between the internal and external phases. With these types of emulsions, emulsifying agents are formed during the compounding process and therefore are called nascent emulsions. The term nascent means beginning to exist or to develop. As the name implies, the emulsifier in the form of a hard or soft soap is formed as the emulsion is made. The, pro the prototype of this emulsion type is the combination of olive oil with lime water. Olive oil is the original oil used because of all the vegetable oils, it has the largest amount of free fatty acid necessary for forming the soap emulsifying agent. Olive oil may be replaced by other vegetable oils. However, when doing so, you may need to add extra free fatty acid in the form of oleic acid drops. The oil is not just added to water. The water phase we are referring to is lime water. 
lime water is a 0.3% solution of calcium hydroxide in purified water. Lime water is actually a supersaturated solution and only this supernatant or clear liquid should be used. The excess calcium hydroxide should be allowed to settle to the bottom of the container and left alone. When olive oil is mixed and shaken vigorously with lime water, the lime water interacts with the free fatty acids within the olive oil. Specifically, calcium hydroxide reacts with the oleic acid to form calcium oleate and emulsifier. Calcium oleate is a hard soap which forms a water in oil emulsion. Having the lime water as the internal phase limits its direct exposure to the skin. More importantly, it is crucial to understand that lime water would never be used for an oral emulsion. Nascent soap emulsions are strictly and only used for topical products used externally. This slide illustrates the bottle method used when preparing a nascent soap emulsion. With the bottle method, you begin, as we show on the left hand side of this picture, by placing equal amounts of the oil, such as olive oil or another oil with additional oleic acid added, along with the lime water in the bottle. In this example, we have placed approximately 50 milliliters of lime water, which is 0.3% calcium hydroxide solution, along with 50 milliliters of olive oil. The bottle is then shaken vigorously for at least one minute to form the emulsion. The resulting emulsion, as shown on the right hand side of this picture, can now be used as a wetting agent for any additional solid or insoluble ingredients that need to be incorporated into the final product. This can be done using a mortar and pestle with trituration of the solids. An alternative to using the bottle method is using the mortar method. In fact, the mortar method is the preferred method when the formulation contains solid insoluble ingredients such as zinc oxide and calamine. With the mortar method, the solids are placed in the mortar and the oil is added in portions with trituration until all of the oil has been added and a smooth slurry of the oil and powders is obtained. The lime water is then added in portions with vigorous trituration and the emulsion will form itself due to the produ production of the nascent emulsifier calcium oleate. To summarize, the two methods, the bottle method is the quickest and easiest way to form a nascent soap emulsion, whereas the mortar method is often used when additional solid insoluble ingredients need to be incorporated into the emulsion. Regardless of the method used, any nascent soap emulsion formed using lime water would only be used externally, applied topically to the skin. The third and final emulsifier type to discuss is the use of non-ionic surfactants. The most common non-ionic surfactants used as emulsifying agents for liquid emulsions are combinations of polysorbates and sorbitan esters and are commonly referred to as spans and tweens. Spans and tweens are complex esters derived from polyols, alkaline oxides, fatty acids, and fatty alcohols. The hydrophilic portion of these molecules consists of free hydroxyl and oxyethylene groups, whereas the lipophilic part has long-chain hydrocarbons of fatty acids and fatty alcohols. Although they are given a chemical designation based on their primary component, these are all actually complex mixtures of closely related derivatives. For example, Sorbitan monooleate, also known as span 80, is a mixture, but the primary component is sorbitan monooleate. On the other hand, polysorbate 80, known as tween 80, is a combination of polyoxyethylene 20 combined with sorbitan monooleate. Here, the 20 indicates that there are approximately 20 moles of ethylene oxide for each mole of sorbitol and sorbitol anhydride. Spans and tweens are used frequently in compounding because they are both stable to heat and are also stable over a wide range of pH values, all of which makes them very useful for a wide variety of different compounds. What is important is that you understand the differences in properties between spans and the tweens. Spans are lipophilic and therefore have low HLB value and thus favor the formation of water in oil emulsions. We will discuss HLB values in more detail on the next slide. On the other hand, tweens are much more hydrophilic, have a higher HLB value, and tend to favor oil in water emulsions. Both spans and tweens are usually measured by weight rather than volume. 
This is due to the fact that at room temperature, these emulsifiers are very thick liquids, almost semi-solids, which makes standard volumetric measurements impractical. Therefore, one common technique employed is to actually use an empty syringe and place it on an electronic balance. The balance is then zeroed and the syringe removed. The syringe plunger is then completely removed by pulling it out backward. The syringe can then be backfilled with the desired emulsifier and the plunger reinserted carefully to avoid squirting any product, and then weighed and reweighed as you are expelling product through the tip until you finally obtain the desired weight of emulsifier. When you have the desired weight, then the emulsifier contained within the syringe can be completely expelled into the final compounding bottle. Thus, even though spans and tweens are measured by weight, we can physically manipulate them as liquids. Lastly, the total weight of emulsifier added to most liquid emulsions is between 2 to 5 percent weight per volume. In Pharmacy Skills Lab, we often have, in, have you use 5 percent total weight per volume. This means that if we are compounding 100 milliliters of an emulsion, a 5% total weight per volume requires 5 grams total of all emulsifiers. Next, we will discuss how to divide this total up between different combinations of spans and tweens. These non-ionic surfactants are mixed in various proportions to produce either water and oil or oil and water emulsions. This flexibility is why they are so valuable. They can be used to form either type of emulsion. The appropriate amounts of the individual emulsifiers needed to form a specific emulsion type can be determined using a mathematical system called the hydrophile-lipophile balance, or HLB system. The HLB system assigns numeric values to fats and oils and to emulsifiers based on the relative amounts of the hydrophilic and lipophilic portions present in these molecules. The system is based on the fact that all surfactant molecules have both hydrophilic, meaning water-loving, and lipophilic, meaning oil-loving, portions. The balance between these two parts varies with the surfactant. In the HLB system, numbers ranging from 1 to 20 were assigned to surfactants based on this balance. Lower numbers were given to the lipophilic compounds and higher numbers given to the hydrophilic compounds. For example, span and arlacel surfactants are considered to be lipophilic with HLB values in the range of 1.8 to 8.6. These surfactants with low HLB values tend to form water and oil emulsions. On the other hand, tween emulsifiers have high HLB values in the range of 9.6 to 16.7. They are more hydrophilic and favor oil and water emulsions. The table on the left gives the HLB values for some of the common non-ionic surfactants used in compounding. The table on the right gives published data on target HLB values for various types of formulations and ingredients. The HLB value required for a particular emulsion will differ depending on whether the final product desired is either an oil and water or water and oil emulsion. For example, when emulsifying mineral oil, a target HLB value of 5 is required to formulate a water and oil emulsion, whereas a target value of 12 is required if formulating an oil and water emulsion. In summary, these are two extremely important tables for being able to use non-ionic surfactants. The table on the left gives HLB values for the various non-ionic surfactants, while the table on the right gives target HLB values for various ingredients to create either oil and water or water and oil emulsions. These HLB values are then used to calculate the required weight of the emulsifiers to be used. These calculations will be discussed next. Before our discussion on calculating emulsifier weights, I wanted to help visualize the difference between spans and tweens. This slide shows on the left tween 80, a high HLB surfactant, and on the right span 20, a low HLB value surfactant. It is important to note that unlike acacia, non-ionic surfactants are not viscosity inducing agents. Tweens with a high HLB value tend to be thin, fluid, and watery, as shown on the left. In contrast, spans which have a much lower HLB value tend to be much more thick and viscous, as shown in the right. 
when using these emulsifiers depending on the final hlb of the product it may be necessary to add a viscosity inducing agent to increase the viscosity to help retard the rate of creaming this also depends on the phase ratio of the ingredients an emulsion with a high concentration of the internal phase will be more viscous than a preparation with a small amount of dispersed internal phase for an oil and water oral preparation flavored syrup such as orange or cherry syrup may be substituted for all or part of the water because it will serve the dual function of both flavoring as well as increasing the viscosity and density of the external phase and thereby hopefully reduce the creaming of the final product the next couple of slides will go through an example and outline a method used for working with HLB values to formulate an emulsion. This slide lists five general steps. Step one is to calculate the total combined weight of all emulsifiers needed. That range is typically two to five percent weight per volume. As stated, in Pharmacy Skills Lab, we will always have you use five percent weight per volume. Remember, that 5% weight is the total weight of all emulsifiers used. The second step is to consult the table and determine the final HLB value required to emulsify the internal phase based on the ingredient and whether the emulsion is to be in oil and water or water and oil. The third step is to consult the table of the emulsifier HLB values and determine the HLB values for the specific emulsifiers to be used. The fourth step is to use the target HLB value and the HLB value of each emulsifier to set up an allegation equation. The fifth and final step is to solve the allegation equation to calculate the individual weights of our specific emulsifiers to use. Now we will apply those five steps to a specific example. You are asked to prepare 180 milliliters of an oil and water oral emulsion containing 30 milliliters of mineral oil in a flavored vehicle using span 80 and tween 40 as emulsifiers. Step one is to calculate the total weight of emulsifiers needed. Therefore, multiply 180 milliliters by 5% or 5 grams over 100 milliliters to determine that 9 grams of emulsifier is needed. Recall that the 5% is a weight per volume or grams per milliliter. Thus, when you multiply the percent by a volume in milliliters, your result will be in grams. Step two is to determine the required total HLB value from the table. Look on the top table and on the left hand column find mineral oil. Then look across the mineral oil row and find the column specific for formulating an oil and water emulsion and read the value, which should be in this case 12. The value of 12 is our target HLB value. Step three is to locate the HLB values for the specific emulsifiers, in this case span 80 and tween 40 in the lower table. Doing so, the HLB value for span 80 is 4.3 and for tween 40 is 15.6. We now know everything needed to proceed to step four. To summarize, to set up the allegation in step four, you need to know the total weight of emulsifiers, which in this example is nine grams, and the target HLB value for the emulsion, which in this example is 12, as well as the specific HLB values for the emulsifiers being used which in this example is 4.3 for span 80 and 15.6 for tween 40. Step four is to set up the allegation equation, which is shown on the next slide. This slide shows steps four and five, which are the allegation equation and subsequent calculation. I do not want to spend time now to review the entire process of performing allegation calculations. If you have any questions about these calculations, please refer to other materials available for reviewing calculations. It will suffice to say here that the allegation is set up by putting tween 40 on top since it has the high HLB value. So 15.6 is set up on top. Below that, place the lower value of 4.3 for span 80. Next, to the right and in the middle, put the target HLB value of 12. Next, follow the arrows and cross subtract. 
begin by subtracting 12 from 15.6 to get 3.6 and following the arrows put that value across from the span 80. Likewise, subtract 4.3 from 12 to get 7.7 .7. and again following the arrows put that value across from the tween 40. We have determined that we need 7.7 .7 parts of tween 40 and 3.6 parts of span 80. At this point, this is where many students forget how to proceed. The next step is to determine the total number of parts by adding 7.7 .7 parts plus 3.6 parts to get a total of 11.3 parts. Next, divide the individual parts by the total number of parts. Thus, for tween 40, take its parts of 7.7 .7 and divide by 11.3 to get 0 0.68, which means 68% of the total weight. For span 80, take its 3.6 parts and divide by a total of 11.3 parts to get 0 0.32, which means 32% of the total weight. The last step is to multiply each percent by the total weight of emulsifier needed. Thus, for tween 40, multiply 9 grams by 0 0.68 gives 6.1 grams to use. And for span 80, multiply 9 grams by 0 0.32 gives 2.9 grams to use. Obviously, the individual amounts of tween 40 and span 80 should add up to the total amount of emulsifier needed, as it does in this case, where 6.1 plus 2.9 added together equals the total of 9 grams. This slide illustrates the bottle method used to compound the oral emulsion example we just discussed. Follow along with the picture starting on the top left as I describe the compounding procedure. Because mineral oil is the internal phase, we begin by carefully measuring 30 milliliters into our actual dispensing bottle. Note, our final volume will be 180 milliliters or 6 ounces. However, because the product needs to be shaken vigorously before each dose is withdrawn, we choose to use an oversized 8 ounce bottle or 240 milliliter bottle. Next, weigh the correct amount of tween 40 and span 80. Recall, even though these are liquids, we need to obtain the correct amount by weight. We would use the method I have previously described for obtaining the correct weight of each liquid in a syringe. Next, completely add each emulsifier to the bottle containing the mineral oil. The order in which the emulsifiers are added does not matter. Cap the bottle and shake vigorously for up to one minute. It is extremely important to get the emulsifiers completely mixed and distributed throughout the internal phase before proceeding. Next, uncap the bottle and carefully pour to a total volume of 180 milliliters using the water-based flavoring vehicle. Note, the volume of the flavoring vehicle added may not be exactly 150 milliliters due to the fact that the emulsifiers will occupy some volume. What is important is that the total volume of all ingredients is precisely 180 milliliters. The final and very critical step is to recap the bottle and shake vigorously for no less than one minute. This vigorous shaking of the bottle will provide the energy necessary to form the emulsion. That completes the mineral oil example that we have been discussing. However, in a different example, for an external emulsion when solids are to be added, then the addition of those solids must be done in a mortar. In that case, the bottle method can be used to make the primary emulsion first and then poured in portions with trituration into the mortar containing the solids. Besides the bottle or mortar method for creating emulsions, electronic mixers and homogenizers are now commonly used. Handheld mixers or blenders using spinning blades or propellers are introduced into the liquids to create a shearing action. The faster the blades spin, the greater the shearing action, which results in smaller droplets. Homogenizers work by forcing a mixture of liquids through a small opening at high pressure, creating a shearing action that creates globules to break up into smaller droplets. Commercial mixers, such as the Unguator, are available that spin at extremely high speeds. 
these mixers use specialized lids and jars so that the mixing can be completed in the final dispensing container thereby reducing waste and the time required for preparation by using very high speeds and the specialized mixing blades the unguator produces thoroughly mixed compounds with small droplets as well as very fine particle size when solids are introduced into the formulation for external products these commercial high-speed mixers are often referred to as an electronic mortar and pestle an example formulation of an external emulsion prepared using an unguator is shown on the following slide okay today we're going to be talking about the unguator it's this machine right here there's a place for your cap and then up here is where you put the bit it's a very expensive machine, so do your best to try not to break it. Uh, what the unguator machine uses is these ointment jars that are specially made for it. They come in all different sizes. There's a little one. Here's a big one. They even come bigger than that. Um, but in the bottom, there's a little base that actually moves if you push it. So you can push it up and push it down. And on the cap, there's actually, if you remove this white cap here, there's a hole there. So if you have a thick ointment or paste or something, uh, your patient can use it to squirt some out um, and then recap it. Kind of like a, a ointment tube or something, but in a plastic jar. Uh, here are the uh, bits that the unguator uses. They come in different sizes and lengths depending on the uh, jar you're going to use. As you can see, that one would fit that one, and this smaller one would fit this smaller one here. Um, what they do is they spin around and mix everything up. What we're making today is we have four grams of acetyl alcohol. I already triturated it out here and triturated it pretty good. I have 76 grams of my white petrolatum and I just plopped them both in there and uh, later we're going to add some water to it. Uh, All together should be about 100 mils. So most important thing is making sure everything will fit into your unguator jar that you choose. So. First, I walk over to my unguator, make sure it's on. I take my bit and I take my cap. I put the cap on first and it screws into this little hole on the base of the machine there. You then put your bit in. The bit just goes up the hole all the way up. You turn it about a quarter turn and make sure it's locked in before you do anything else. And then you'd put your uh, bottom of your jar on and you'd screw it in um, firmly. You then come over to the machine. Um, the green numbers here are your time, and where the E is, that's your RPM. So I'm going to hit the RPM button so I can change it. So since I hit RPMs, I can change the RPMs. If I hit the clock button, I'd be able to mess with the time as well. I then hit the power button to start it. And what it does is it goes up and down, and the spindle turns at the same time, mixing everything thoroughly. Another name for uh, the unguator is a homogenizer. It homogenizes everything together into one um, consistent mix. Uh, it's really good for emulsions. Uh, at the end of the time, what the unguator does is it'll drop the base down and it'll spin really fast, kind of like when you're making cookies and you need to get everything off the beaters. So there it's dropped down, it's spinning really fast to spin everything off the beaters. So it's done. I can remove it. And at, once I remove it, you'll be able to see it looks completely different. It's uh, kind of a off-white oily consistency. And now I'm going to add my water. Now I'll make sure I'm not going to add too much water that it won't be too full. And then I put it back on the unguator. Just screw it back up there. Change my RPMs again. And I turn it back on. And we'll wait to see what happens when it's done. Okay, now that my emulsion is done, uh, we can see it's pretty thick. It's white. Um, if you have any questions about the unguator, if you want to use it. Now we will discuss preparation guidelines for compounding emulsions. The first preparation guideline describes the quantity to prepare. The USP Chapter 795 states to prepare an excess amount of the total formulation to allow the prescribed quantity to be accurately dispensed. Traditionally, for emulsions, we have prepared 2 or 3% excess to allow for some loss of the product. Loss is common when creating an emulsion using the mortar method. Therefore, when using the mortar method, calculate and prepare 3% excess, but only dispense the prescribed amount. 
on the other hand there is no loss when compounding an emulsion using either the bottle method or automated method such as an electronic mortar and pestle where the mixing occurs in the same container the product is to be dispensed in these cases it is not necessary to compound excess the second preparation guideline is assigning a beyond use date for our final product beyond use dates for emulsions will differ depending on whether the emulsion is intended for internal or external use when the emulsion prepared is for oral internal use the usp chapter 795 states that for water containing oral formulations the beyond use date is not later than 14 days when stored at controlled cold temperatures because all emulsions contain water an oral emulsion must have a 14-day expiration date and clear instructions to be kept the refrigerated this conservative dating and refrigeration storage requirement is to prevent possible microbial growth from occurring in the water phase moreover usp chapter 795 states that antimicrobials or preservatives should be used to prevent contamination however using a commercial product such as a flavoring vehicle that already contains a preservative may suffice otherwise additional preservatives should be added any preservative added should be concentrated in the aqueous phase since that is where the bacterial growth would normally occur on the other hand if the emulsion is intended for external or topical use usp chapter 795 states that for water containing topical or dermal and mucosal liquid and semi-solid formulations that the beyond day use date is not later than 30 days the reason for the less conservative date is partially because many external use preparations are formulated from ingredients such as zinc oxide and calamine which are known to be very stable however it is more likely that the longer beyond use date reflects less concern over microbial contamination it is not that external emulsions are less likely to be contaminated but rather because they are being placed on intact skin which is a normal barrier to bacteria and the risk for any bacterial contamination is minimized the last preparation guidelines to discuss are quality control prescription label and auxiliary labeling documentation of quality control for emulsions includes the written documentation on the compounding record of the final volume prepared its physical appearance color smell if any as well as the size of the droplets the emulsion should be checked for signs of creaming coalescence and any microbial growth the labeling of active ingredients on the prescription label will differ depending on whether the emulsion is intended for internal or external use for internal use formulations Typically, the total volume of oil in the formulation is indicated. For example, as shown on this slide, we labeled an emulsion as having 30 milliliters of mineral oil in a total of 180 milliliters of flavored oral emulsion. Alternatively, you could express the volume of oil per dose amount to be administered, such as per teaspoonful. On the other hand, the labeling is different for topical emulsions, here the amounts of active ingredients are expressed as a percentage weight per volume for example calamine five percent comma zinc oxide ten percent topical emulsion note regardless of the emulsion type the route is clearly indicated so describe the product as either an oral emulsion or a topical emulsion besides the labeling of active ingredients there are some very important auxiliary labels that need to be used all emulsions need to be shake well label attached regardless of whether they're given internally or applied topically this is because even a well formulated emulsion will have some degree of creaming that occurs over time so prior to withdrawing a dose the emulsion needs to be shaken vigorously oral internal use emulsions need to have a 14 day beyond use date and also a keep refrigerated label on the other hand topical or external use only emulsions should have a 30 day beyond use date and a stored room temperature label as well as a for external use only label the latter is very important because topical emulsions are often liquids that could be mistakenly administered orally